we're going to talk about research methodology, and uh, we're going to talk about your thesis. We're going to talk about design and development. And one of the places that we want to start is with the uh, outline structure that we're going to use. Now, why do I encourage my students to use outlines? Because in my experience from writing my doctoral dissertation and from writing uh, many books, you can't really work on a good thesis until you uh, can see it from beginning to end. Okay? And one of the reasons that I go back to the basics is because, in general, uh, in the education system here in Japan, students do not learn to outline properly and do not learn to outline well. Okay, so. Uh, before we get to the outline, I want to look at the basic structure of how uh, most writing is organized, most academic writing is organized, most uh, stories are organized. Okay? And I'll take off the shoes. Okay. There are three basic parts to uh, most pieces of writing that we're going to do. Uh, forget for a moment things like letter writing and poetry. Uh, what are the three parts of most pieces of writing that you look at? The introduction. All right. We have the introduction. Then what? Body. Then the body. And conclusion. The conclusion. All right. In its simplest form, this is what we have. We have the introduction. Okay. We have the body. We have a conclusion. If we're doing a, a, a story, for example, a short story or a fairy tale or something like that, what do we call it then? Beginning? Yeah, okay. Think of Japanese fairy tales. Bukashi, bukashi, aruto, kuroni, right? Okay, we have the beginning. All right, then what? short stories, most fairy tales, uh, children's stories, for example, uh, you'll even hear children say it, the end, right? So the beginning, middle, end, introduction, body, conclusion, basically the same thing. Uh, this is the underlying structure of a lot of writing, when you get down to the essence of it, all right? Uh, and they're basically uh, the same thing, okay? So, Academic writing at universities, especially in writing towards our thesis, for example, we're going to have something similar in there, right? Okay. Now, in your average thesis, how many chapters are there? Should be five. Five? Why five? Because, well, we have the introduction first. All right, so we have an introductory chapter. All right, then what? And then uh, literature review. All right, uh, we're probably going to have some kind of lit review. Yep. A review of the literature, and what do we mean by literature review? Like the, uh, the terminology that we need to know. Uh, well, look at this part. Literature. Literature, what kind of literature? Related to the research area. Okay, related how? How? Related how? Related. Okay, uh, but what do we, what we mean by literature review is what people have done previously. Previous studies. Okay. What other scholars have done? The research that is going to be connected to your research, either directly or indirectly. Okay. So, why do we do a lit review? So that 
so that we don't have to explain all of the things? Well, no, so that we don't reinvent the wheel. All right. This shows, basically the lit review shows that you've done the research, okay? That you've done the background research to know that the experiment that you're going to be conducting later or the research that you're going to be conducting later has not already been done by someone else. Okay? That's essentially the purpose of doing this. Okay? Uh, because if you don't do a literature review uh, and you don't do the background and you can't see that you've done the background, how do we know that your research is new, innovative, um, something in addition to and not just the same thing that other people and that's not to say that sometimes there isn't a place for doing the same research that someone else has done. A replication study, for example, something we call a replication study. Okay. Okay. Uh, for example, retesting someone's theory to see if you get the, re the same result. It's the basis for a lot of empirical research. Okay. So, we have the introduction, we have the lit review, you said five. What would the other three be? Uh, the method methodology. Okay, we're probably going to have a methodology chapter or some form of methodology plus other things. The next. Okay, what would the next one be? Uh, analysis. Okay, could be analysis. Conclusion. Okay, so you have five chapters. Your conclusion. So, all right, and I'm going to put these in Roman numerals because we're going to be talking about all writing. Okay. All right. All right. Looking at these five: introduction, review, methodology, analysis, and conclusions. All right. That seems pretty straightforward, but. Is there anything missing? Analysis of what? Okay, so what do you mean? your experiment actually at? You've got the methodology that tells us the method you're going to use, but where's the experiment? Uh, it should be included in the methodology chapter. Uh, that's one place where you could put it, so let's put it there. Right. Uh, methodology and experiment. All right. I'm okay with that for, for the time being. All right. But you mentioned the analysis, but analysis of what? Yeah, uh, the result of experiment. All right, so yeah, you probably want to change this to results and analysis, something like that. Okay. Because it's very possible to have your results and have simply your results listed as data, objectively. All right, and then in the analysis, this is where you get the subjective side of things. This is where the researcher comes out. Now, is there anything else that you see that's missing? <laughs> is there anything more? Sure. I will tell you right now that often in, in different people's theses, uh, in the thesis of different students, this area gets a little bit mess, messy, okay? Uh, people can reorganize this in different ways depending on the type of methodology that they're using or the type of experimentation tools that they're using, all right? But what I want you to focus on is down here, down at five, okay? Conclusions, yes, but can we say anything else? Limitations? 
Uh, no, limitations will probably come up uh, a bit higher. It's possible to have them there, though. That wasn't quite what I was thinking. References? No, references and stuff will come down here. Okay. Let's say, for example, that you're doing an experiment. And let's take a science experiment, for example, a simple science experiment. And you're testing what happens if we mix liquid A with liquid B in different concentrations. Okay. And let's say, for example, that in the course of this, that you accidentally make a mistake. Okay. For example, uh, in the base, whatever base liquid you're using, and you're mixing A and you're mixing B, at some point you forget the base liquid. And something happens. Something interesting happens. Okay. But it's not the focus of your study. Okay. In other words, it creates new questions. Okay. Wow, I made a mistake, but something interesting happened there. But I don't have time to talk about it right now. What do we call that? Fugitives. Well, not future tips, but yeah, areas of further research, areas of further inquiry. Um, something that says, in the course of the research that I just did, a number of questions came up, and these questions I would like to explore in further research. Okay, And often you will find in graduate study that this happens. For a lot of students who are doing the the uh, thesis, some of those questions that come out could end up being their doctoral dissertation. They could end up being a conference paper, conference presentation, poster presentation. Uh, there's a lot of different avenues that you can find, okay, if it's really, really good research. All right, and in some cases, the main experiment will, you know, be developed in greater detail, and that will become a doctoral dissertation, uh, or it could be one of these periphery questions. But what I would call this is, you know, conclusions and areas of further research. Okay. All right. Does that make sense so far? Yep. Good. Now. Is it okay if I can be racist? Yes. All right. One of my professors, I think it was back at the University of Hawaii, uh, sort of paraphrased this kind of stuff pretty well. Okay. And of course he was talking about uh, dissertation research in its simplest form, but it applies equally to just about any kind of research that you're going to do. What he said was, in three parts, Tell us what you're going to do. Okay. Tell us what you're going to do. Introduction. Okay. Do it. That's your experiment. Okay. And then tell us what you did. Okay. Results and analysis and conclusions. All right. Breaking it again. It's simply introduction by. Tell us what you're going to do, tell us what you did, or tell us what happened. Okay. I'll erase that now. Okay. Now, uh, before we go any further, we should talk a little bit about uh, the structure of outlines. Okay. How to structure an outline. And why do we do that? Because outlining, while fairly common in many places, is a lot less common in Japan. And I find that to be kind of sad. Because the whole purpose of an outline is 
uh, so that you can see in short form the entire research project that you're about to do. Okay. And when you do it, uh, the greater detail you go into with the outline, the easier it's going to be later to sit down and write your thesis. Okay. And when you're writing a thesis, you're looking at somewhere between, I don't know, 60 and 100 pages probably. Uh, when you're doing a doctoral dissertation, for example, you're looking at 200 to 300 pages probably. Okay? Sometimes longer, sometimes a little shorter, depending on the nature of the work that you're doing. Uh, these are long pieces of writing. Okay? And if you are not well organized, it's going to show. Okay? You'll probably find yourself jumping around. You'll probably find yourself sitting at the computer, staring at the screen, wondering what's next. But if you take the time, and if you do the time up front to you know, succinctly outline everything that you're going to be talking about, one, it makes it easier. Two, you can sit just about anywhere and do the work because you're breaking it down into manageable parts and you're focusing on that sole part. So instead of working on a, let's say, let's imagine a 75 page thesis, instead of uh, spending uh, a lot of time sitting and simply you know, typing things into the computer as they come to your mind, you've got it well organized and you can sit down and you can say, today I'm going to work on the introduction and not the entire introduction, introductory chapter, but I'm gonna work on uh, chapter one, section A or section A and B today. Okay. So instead of one long 75 page piece of work, you are breaking it down into manageable parts so that you can write each part and you can go from part to part. You're less likely to miss things because the outline is going to show you what you miss okay, or what you are missing. And by outlining, you're looking at everything uh, sort of like pulling back from the earth in a satellite, looking downward, you can see the whole picture. And you can see the whole picture before you actually sit down and write it. And one of the uh, things that good writers do is, as I told you at the beginning, they can see it from beginning to end. And I recommend, I strongly advise you, not to write your thesis until you can see from beginning to end. Okay? Unless you know where it's going. Okay? So, when we get to outlining, uh, we're going to start with Roman numerals. Okay, and if we're assuming we're gonna have five chapters and that's uh, not unusual, uh, we're gonna take and we're gonna do it this way. Let me just show you the basic structure. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, this is gonna be the chapter level. Okay. Uh, and by chapter level, this is gonna be your chapter, probably your chapter titles for each chapter. Now, each uh, section that we want to identify in the thesis, we're going to tab in one tab, okay? So, when we look at a chapter, what is a chapter made up of? Sections. Okay, it's gonna be made up of sections. So, we're gonna put this in as a section level, okay? capital A for our purposes, and this is going to be a section level. Okay. Is it okay if I erase this for now? Yes. Before I go any further, I want to tell you two simple rules. Okay? There are not very many rules in outlining, but we have two simple ones. And these two simple rules help understand the way that writing happens in English. Okay? The first one is this. Okay? Section, you must have what? B. 
B. Okay. If you have A, you must have B. Okay. So this rule tells us if we have an A, we must have a B. Which means your chapter is going to be made up of at least two sections. Okay. And in scholarly research, it's probably going to be made up of more sections. Okay, you may have three sections, four sections, five sections. After B, you can have as many as the research requires. Okay? So you're going to have at least A and B. Okay? Now, let me spread these out a little bit. Now, when we go down a little further, we're going to tab in again. Okay? There's one tab, there's two tabs. And each of these tabs tells us the importance of that piece of information. Okay? Obviously, the biggest one out there is going to be the chapter. That's pretty important, right? And then you've got the section, whatever your section is going to be. And now we're going to get to this level. What do you think this one is? Key points. All right, it's going to be a key point that we want to make. It could be a point, it could be an argument, okay, it could be, if we're doing case studies, it could be some kind of case study, it could be anything at that level, okay. Uh, an example, point, well, for our purposes, we're going to call it a point, main point, or a key point, all right. And as you see, the, we have this kind of parallel thing going on here with A and B. The second rule says, if you have one, you must have two, two. Simple as that. Okay. So we know we're going to have at least two points to make. Okay. In basic outline. Right. Why do we do this? Because it sort of follows logic. Okay? It's if you're making an argument having a single point, while it may be valid, doesn't make for very good reading. Okay? That's one of the points. Alright? So if we have two sections, it serves a number of purposes. Okay? One is a second point often helps to justify your cause. Uh, also, look what this does. It breaks your chapter up. Okay, so let's imagine that you're writing, for example, a 30 page chapter, okay, or 20 page chapter. Uh, if you read it straight through with no section breaks, okay, it gets kind of long, right? Especially when you're reading academic research. It's possible to do that in a story, for example. If you're reading a novel or something, you'll, you can go 30, 40 pages, no problem. But what you have here is, you know, in many cases, very uh, a very high level of scholarly research that you're reading and you're trying to understand. Breaking it into pieces helps the reader. Okay, so that helps. Okay. So, all right. So we have the chapter level, we have the section level, we have our point level. Now, let me break this down a little further. your point you're making and let's say that uh, you have a couple of examples okay. less important we'll go down another level we'll call this small a and we might put it in as an 
example, for example. If I have example one, example two. Okay. And these examples will support the point. Because this is an A, even though it's a small A, because it's an A, we must have a B. And after that, let's say we have three examples, we'll put a C in. That's example three. Right? Same thing down here. Okay. Can you see this starting to get bigger and bigger? Okay. As we get bigger and bigger, we're adding more detail. And by adding more detail, we are less likely to forget things that we're trying to make. So, let me break this down further. Okay, we know we're going to have a B example. All right. Uh, let's say we have a couple of important details we want to remember. Okay, we'll go down to a level and we'll call it a detail level. Okay, small Roman numeral one. Okay. So detail one, detail two, to help us not forget things. Again, we tap in one level, and we do this. Now, I'm taking time to go into this because I think it's important. Okay. The more information you put here, the less, in, less time you're going to spend sitting at the computer staring at the computer screen, wondering what you're supposed to do next. When I was writing my doctoral dissertation, I wasn't quite sure how to go about doing it. I mean, think about it. If you've never written something that large before, if you've never written a 200-page paper before, it's kind of intimidating. You're sitting there thinking, God, I've got all this stuff I've got to say. I've got all this stuff to do. How am I going to fill the sheets of paper? And how am I going to get it, you know, out of my head and onto paper and onto paper in a logical way, in a, in a, a way that's going to make it so that the reader can understand it? And one day when I was in one of my classes, I wasn't really paying attention to what the professor was saying. Uh, I started playing around with my chapters. This was before I was actually approved to start writing them. Okay? I was playing around with my chapters. What would my chapters be? And I still had time on my hands. What would my sections be? And I started playing with this, and the idea started developing. And the more I did this, the more I could see what I was doing. Okay? In the end, my dissertation ended up being about 292 pages, but the outline itself was about seven pages single-spaced. Okay, for nine chapters, seven pages. And it made it so much easier when I sat down and wrote it. And in my case, uh, I was basing the way that I was going to write my dissertation on something I had heard when I was back in England. Okay? When I was at Cambridge, one of the professors Peter Matthews told me one day that uh, another linguist, another famous linguist, Sir John Lyons, was capable of writing 2,000 words per day. Okay, 2,000 words is basically an academic paper. Every day, he was capable of that. Okay, and I've always been a writer. Okay, and I like the challenge of it. So I had decided that I wanted to keep up with. I wanted to write 2,000 words a day while I was writing my dissertation. And I did it for two reasons. And I'll tell you the reasons in a minute. Okay? And there's no way you can write 2,000 words a day unless you're extremely organized. Okay? Most people's work like that. Okay? I had to organize everything on a clear. And by the time I got done with the seven-page outline, and I looked at it, I could see it from beginning to end, 
as I was working on it, I could see mistakes. I could see areas that I didn't have an answer for that I needed to go back. In some cases, I could see places where ah, this looks good here, but I think it looks better down here. And I'd rearrange the parts and suddenly, wow, it works. Okay. And when I started writing my dissertation, I had a complete outline from beginning to end. And I sat down and I was capable of writing 2,000 words a night. And I did. Sometimes I wrote more than that. Okay. I wrote my entire dissertation in four months. Okay. For many people, it takes years. Okay. And that's not to say that when I got done with the first draft, it wasn't, you know, it was absolutely perfect. It wasn't absolutely perfect. I had to go back and revise a couple of times. But I was far ahead of a lot of students because I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I want, how I wanted to test it. And I knew how I wanted to write that. Okay. And when I got done writing 292 pages in four months, okay, I graduated shortly after that. That dissertation became my first book. Okay. It was written well enough that it was able to be turned from a dissertation into a book really quickly. Okay. Now, so as you can see, I believe in the system. Every book that I write, every book that I write, and I've written 30 of them so far, not including the ones that are in, in the publication chain right now, every book that I write gets an online. Before I write a book, before I write a textbook, before I write any of these things, I know exactly what's going to go in every chapter. I know what each chapter subject will be. I know what each title is going to be. I know what the structure of each chapter is going to be. Because I'll work out a mock chapter, just like we're going to do in the, the other class. We'll work out a mock chapter. We'll decide on it, what it's going to be. We'll put an outline to it. And we'll outline throughout the entire book. Once that's decided, then it makes things a lot easier. Uh, and you can work meticulously through everything without forgetting a lot of important details. Uh, one of the hardest things for writers to do is to go back and put in something that they forgot. Because it really breaks up the continuity of everything you've written already. Okay. So doing it ahead of time will save you a great deal of time. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay, chapter, section, point, example, detail. Okay. And you know, as you do this, and as you start filling in your information into that, uh, you're going to start seeing areas where you need to at least consider it. Consider what you're doing. You're going to find areas where um, something you you want to move something. And in some cases, you'll look at it and say, "Hey, that's what it should be." Use the outline to tell you where you're making mistakes. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. So tell me again, what were the two rules for outlines? For outlines, uh, if you have A, you must have B. Yep. The other one is you have one. Then you have to have two. Perfect. Good. Not very difficult, is it? Okay. Actually, the entire outlining process is easy. But either people ignore it, or they're simply too lazy as writers to use it. Every good writer I know secretly does something. And you know, as a graduate student, when you pick up a piece of writing, what I want you to be capable, capable, capable of doing is I want you to be capable of identifying the underlying structure. And by underlying structure, I mean skeleton. I call it a skeleton. Okay. Being able to pick up a book and look at it and say, how did the author organize his or her information? Why did they organize it this way? It's always a good intellectual question to ask yourself when you're reading something. If you're reading a newspaper article, take a look at it. How did the author organize the ideas? 
magazine, book, you know, novel, uh, piece of literature, looking at scientific study. You know, each one has a skeleton to it somehow. Okay, unless it's just free form writing. You know, someone is just writing you know, off the top of their head. So I hope you'll be capable of doing that. Now, let's talk about chapter one. The introduction. We know chapter one is going to be our introduction. Right? And we know from our rules that there's going to be, at a minimum, an A and a B, right? So this is how much information we have right now. We know that we're going to have an A and we're going to have a B, at least. Now, what are A and B going to be? So A, it's going to be the actual introduction. Good guess. All right. real introduction is going to be an A. If you do it that way, then what's your B going to be? The organization? Perhaps. Okay. Let's, let's just sort of brainstorm for a minute about the things that we're going to need to put into chapter one. Okay? Some type of mention of organization. What else? The reason for the research? Why I'm doing this research. This research yes. is interesting to read. Let me put that up there. I wouldn't phrase it that way, but I'll put it up there just so we don't forget it. Okay. Now, what else we need? Contribution for the society? No, yeah, you could mention that. That that would be something good if it has a contribution to society. Okay. Uh, if you're doing purely theoretical research, uh, that kind of statement may not be there. Uh, if you're doing practical, some type of practical research, that probably it's going to be in there somewhere. Right. There are some exceptions to that. What else? the research question. Mention it down in the methodology, of course. 
But you might want to you might want to say you know something in the introduction about how you're going to conduct the research. Perhaps. told you before, what do we call this? It's a very minor detail, it's sort of a stylistic point. We want readers to read what we're writing. Any good writer will know that if they don't catch the reader in the first paragraph, they're probably going to skip to the conclusion or they're going to skip to the results and they're not going to read what you wrote. Now that's bad in research because if they go right to your results and they don't read the thing, they may misrepresent what you're saying in their own publications. Okay, That's one of the possible outcomes for it. How do we bring readers into what we're writing? Now, a lot of professors won't talk about this, a lot of teachers won't talk about this, but I will because I like good writing. Okay? We need some uh, basic type of attention getter. Okay? And this is just a minor little thing. I'm just going to put it in here just so that it, it's not a main point or anything, but it's something we don't want to forget. Okay? We're going to have some type of attention getter. What's an attention getter? What are some examples of attention getters? Giving a little interesting story. Or it could be a story. If it's brief, a very brief story. There are, there are more common things that people tend to use. Examples? Could be an example. Could be quotes. Could be a quotation. Yes, something someone said that is has impact. That's connected to your research. Okay. In the case of quotations, when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, every chapter started with a quotation. It wasn't part of the actual text. It was before the text. It's called epigraph or something like that. It's a quotation before the, the entire chapter starts. Okay. And in the case of my research, since I was working on brand names and genericization, I had to look from a lot of different fields for interesting things that were connected to the chapters I was talking about. Uh, I found a lot of uh, interesting quotes in Through the Looking Glass, uh, Lewis Carroll's. Alice in Wonderland stories. And uh, I found quite a bit of interesting stuff there. There's quite a good linguist. Okay. And I took those and I put them up there, but I had things from uh, philosophers, I had things from linguists, I had things from you know, story writers that started my chapters off. But the whole point was to get the reader to think about what's coming up in the chapter. How is this connected? So quotations are quite good. Uh, what else? You're missing a big one. To 
get the people's attention? to justify the research in one way, you might say, for example, you might use a statistic and open with something like, in Japan last year, 110,000 people died as a result of smoking-related illnesses. Okay. In this research, I'm going to go on from there. Right? That's a very powerful number. And by using something that strong, it immediately draws the reader in. How is this connected? Okay. When you're reading a newspaper, for example, uh, journalism students are taught this from the beginning. They're taught that every piece of writing you do must have a hook. Okay. And the hook is just another way to say an attention getter. Something to bring the reader in. If you don't catch them, like hooking a fish, if you don't catch them within the first couple of sentences, as I said before, they're going to go back and simply go to the conclusions and leave it at that. Okay. So we could have an example, quotation statistics, uh, a brief story, something that brings the reader in. Uh, let me give you an example. Okay. In my dissertation, when I wrote my dissertation, I brought the readers in not only by the epigraphs, the, the quotations in the beginning, but I had a introduction that was a story as you mentioned. And because I was dealing with brand names, I started my dissertation with the idea of someone waking up in the morning. And they wake up and they go down to breakfast and you know they have their uh, Aunt Jemichael brand pancakes and they have their Land O'Lakes butter and they have their Oneida silverware and they have, uh, they might have uh, sun-kissed orange juice before the day has even begun, they are confronted with brand upon brand upon brand upon brand. Okay. Often unconsciously. Okay. And I brought the reader in that way, into the story, to say, I'm going to be focusing on the linguistics of brand names, on the idea of genericization, how this happens, uh, all of the structures, all the changes that go on because of it, and I'm doing so by showing how brand names relate to everyone and bring the reader in that way. Okay. And consequently, I do the same thing at the end of the story. At the end of the story, at the end of the dissertation, 200 and something pages later, we come back to what we came to in the first paragraph. We come back to the speaker again. He's getting ready for bed. Okay. Climbs into his Ralph Lauren sheets. Okay. And you know he sets his Sony alarm clock, and he kisses Parker good night, and end of story. Okay. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter five. We'll talk about the idea of a last thought. Okay, a last thought. A last thought is quite simply uh, the same thing as an attention getter on the opposite end. When the reader puts down your thesis, when the reader puts down a dissertation, when the re reader puts down your newspaper article or whatever it is you're reading, you want them to walk away still thinking about what you just told them. And the best writing does that. So, we have an attention getter. And if we want to, we can call it one if you, if you really want to, if that's really that important to you. We can call it one. Okay. 
if you have a one, of course, you're going to need a two. Uh, what might the two be here? We've covered this. know what this is going to be, one of the best things you can do is skip it for now and go on to B and see what B is and then see what might go in between. Okay? So what would we want B to be? Save that until you tell us for what the research is. Okay. So B is going to be probably what what is your research problem? Okay. Alright. Or what is the research question? What is the research question? Okay. Now, what's another way of saying this? This is statement? Exactly. Uh, Bravo. Good job. Yes. Okay. You have to tell us what the research is about. And in just about anything you do in your regular academic writing, in your undergraduate classes, and, and in your graduate classes, at some point you're going to have to get to a thesis statement. And your thesis statement is simply, what is the research question? What is it that you're going to be looking at in this paper? What is the main focus? Okay. So what is the research question? Paraphrasing, it can't be, what is your thesis? Or your thesis statement? you've got the attention getter and once you've got your thesis statement, all right? It looks like you don't need anything in there, all right? But let's say, for example, that we use a statistic, okay? Remember, I gave you the 110,000 smoker thing, okay? And now we get to the, the, the statement, what the problem is going to be. In this study, I'm going to look at What's this going to be? Okay, again, just like the attention getter, I'm only putting this stuff in here because I don't want you to forget it. Okay. Good writers will do this normally automatically, but I'm, I'm getting into the smallest details I can get into just as a reminder. Okay. Your attention getter, let's say it's a statistic and let's say your thesis statement is I'm going to look at the impact on families. Somehow you have to connect this idea to this idea. Okay. So I'm just going to say for right now we're just going to put in some connectors. Connecting sentences. Or connecting sentence. All right. You may not need it. But often it helps to somehow have a couple of sentences that lead into this thesis statement, somehow, okay? So for right now, I'm going to put that in there. At a later point, as you're working through this chapter, and as you keep revising this outline, you may find that you don't need this, and that something else might go there. I have no idea what it would be, but you may find something. Good so far? Yep. Great. Okay. So what's the research question? We finally got to that. Now, now 
how we can get to the Why? Why? Okay, why not? Do you want to put it as a section of the thesis statement or do you want a separate section? What does the outline tell you? I uh, want to put it in the section. Why? kind of the fun of doing an outline. All right? And I like to think of an outline as like doing a jigsaw puzzle, okay? Where you've got all the pieces scrambled and you start by, you know, putting the border together and then you start sort of fitting pieces in, right? And let me tell you before we continue that uh, there's not only one correct way to write a thesis, okay? There's lots of different ways to write a thesis. Some are better than others. Uh, but there are actually many good ways of writing a thesis. If I took 10 scholars, okay, uh, males, females, different ages, but they're all academics, okay, good scholarly writers, and I gave them all the same research topic, how many papers do you think would be alike? Yeah, you might have a couple that overlap, but you're probably going to find that everybody takes a slightly different approach to it, depending on a lot of factors, depending on their background, depending on you know what they feel is important. So what I want to say to you is I'm showing you one way to do it, but when you create your own outline for your research, trust your instinct. Trust your instinct. What seems logical to me? Because it's not me that's going to be writing it. It's going to be you writing it. Right? I can give you advice. Your supervisor can give you advice. But ultimately, you are going to be the master of your subject at that level. Okay? And when it comes to doing a, you know, a dissertation later, if you choose to do the doctorate, then it's going to be completely innovative research, and probably you're going to become the expert on that subject. Right? Okay. So, I'm showing you one way. All right. So you're considering putting it in here, and maybe that'll work. Okay. So let's put it in. Let's put it in there for right now, and let's say uh, why. I am doing this research, what would your two be? Contribution. Okay, I will agree that you should, you know, somehow probably put these two together. Why I'm doing the research, it's a contribution to society. Okay, so for right now we'll put it down as a two. Anything else? Okay. All right. You still have a couple things on your list up there. You still have organization and you still have how you conduct the research.
Of organization. What do you want to do with it? That will be a different section. A different section? Okay. Okay, what do you mean by organization? Organization of what? The thesis. Okay. All right, that's possible. possible. So for example, if you did your organization like that, then you might have uh, your uh, points level being what's coming in chapter two, what's coming in chapter three, what's coming in chapter four, a brief overview. Okay, so instead of organization, let's call it overview. Could be an overview of the thesis. Like I said, uh, your points will be chapter two, three, four, five. Okay, that's possible. All right, but looking at this information, is there any other way to organize this? <clears throat> One other alternative is to create another additional section. And somehow focusing on the thesis statement here and maybe making some of this into a C section. That's possible also. It's going to, as I said, it's going to depend on how you, as a writer, organize this information and organize it logically. What you may find out is that your section A is very short, your section B is huge, and your section C is very short. If that's the case, then you may want to explore other sections and say, well, maybe why I'm doing this research and contribution, we know those are together. We know those are going to be together. So maybe that's a C-section. Okay? How I'll conduct the research is a brief overview of the methodology. And if you're going to do that, you might also want to briefly cover your hypotheses. Right? <clears throat> How I'll conduct the research, I'm going to do a survey, I'm going to do participant observation, I'm going to do you know, armchair research in the library. What are you going to do? And at some point, you're going to have to talk about hypotheses for that. You may want to put the hypotheses under the thesis statement. Say, in this study, I'm going to look at uh, the impact of x on y. Okay, <clears throat> And in doing so, I have three hypotheses. And then your 1, 2, and 3 would be hypothesis 1, hypothesis 2, hypothesis 3. Okay, My point is, one, that there's not only one correct way of doing this. Your research and your organization abilities will help you determine that. And you'll be able to see as you start putting the pieces together which sections are going to be too long and you need to break those up. Uh, some sections are too short, I need to find something else to go in there. The more legwork you do here, the easier it's going to be later. And the better it's going to be. One of the sort of demoralizing things that happens to graduate students is the first time they turn in a draft of a chapter. If they don't have a really good outline, they turn in a draft of a chapter, a draft of their thesis, and it just comes back with red ink all over it. Okay, reorganize this, redo this, redo this, redo this. The better your outline is, the less, of that, that, that less likely that that is going to happen. And also, at the same time, the happier your supervisor's going to be. <laughs> Right? Because it's a lot of work for supervisors to read these things. Okay? Here at Shodai, normally we only have one student per professor or two students per professor, but imagine in a lot of universities where they're supervising six or eight or ten or twelve students okay. at the graduate level, and then perhaps some at the undergraduate level as well. So the better you do with this, the happier your supervisor will be. But your research is going to tell you what it needs to be done. So what I would suggest to you is keep in mind that with your thesis statement, you may want to mention um, some, something about how you conduct the research for that. 
and also um, what your hypothesis might be. And then down here, you might want to talk about why you're doing your research as contribution to society, and then go to the overview. That would make logical sense also. But again, it depends on your topic, okay, the kind of research you're doing. Right. Remember, the whole purpose of this is the introduction. And the introduction in includes all of this stuff. Now, when we get down to the bottom of this, when we get down to the overview, uh, before we go on to the next chapter, I always tell my students to put in some kind of connecting sentence. What do I mean by connecting sentence? Original to chapter two? Yeah, uh, it's just a heads up that chapter two is coming. So. Uh, as I said down here in the overview of the rest of the thesis in chapter two, I'll be doing the lit review in chapter three, I'll be doing methodology and experiment, chapter four results, results and analysis, chapter five conclusions and further research. Uh, having said that, now let's turn to chapter two in the literature review. It's a connecting sentence, basically. And I just tell students to do this not to forget. Okay. Normally in an outline, we wouldn't have to tell people to do that. Okay. It's just like the attention. Any questions? No. Oh, excellent. <laughs> uh, I dropped my cap out there. It's okay. Uh, so in today's lesson, we looked at we looked at uh, chapter one, and we looked at the introduction. We looked at uh, organizational structure of most of the types of writing that you'll read. We looked at the ability to look at skeletons. We looked at uh, outline structure. And we looked at how you might outline chapter one in you know, completely. Okay. Uh, when we come back, we're going to look at uh, chapter two, which is going to be our literature.